Okay, so this is obviously about preparing students and a workforce for the oncoming data tsunami, which is already upon us. Uh, let me give you the backstory to this whole iNeuro project. Uh, a few years ago, I had the pleasure and privilege to go and serve at the United States National Science Foundation. And there I heard a talk by Sean Hill who talked about neuroinformatics, and this really piqued my interest. So let's take, for example, the studies we heard about this morning on macaques and marmosets. Those are very expensive studies. They're very time intensive. And as somebody who has spent a lot of time peering through microscopes, I bet they're a little bit tedious for the people actually doing the work. So I'm a neuroscience educator, and there's no way in my 10-week course we're going to do anything like that. But if I can grab that data and have my students analyze it in a new and interesting way, that's a very valuable resource. So that's how I got into this world. And so right after I left the National Science Foundation, I had coffee with a couple colleagues, uh, former program officers there at the National Science Foundation, and they said, you know, we're going to have a data tsunami. I'm like, yeah, it's probably already here. He said, you know, we are not training students to deal with this data tsunami. I was like, yeah, we're, you're right, we're, we're not. And they said, you know, if someone were to write a grant to hold a conference about what that curriculum of training would be, we'd fund that grant. And then they paused for a real uncomfortable long time and stared at me, and I got the hint. So I wrote the grant and put together the conference. And so what I'm going to do in this presentation is talk about the recommendations that came out of that conference and where we are now and, at least in my opinion, where we should go. So I didn't have the foresight to actually take a picture of the participants of the conference, but it looked a whole lot like this. And Mary Ann was there. I, I think you can find uh, the one that's representing her in there, too. So I got together all these smart, informed people to think about this curriculum and how we should train students. So the cast, uh, I had uh, managers and purveyors of data resources. For example, I had people from the Allen Brain Institute. Uh, I had people involved in bioinformatics training thinking perhaps neuroinformatics training could use them as a model. Uh, we had library and information scientists, computer scientists, and of course people like me who are neuroscience educators. So we started by talking about the skills that they would want this workforce to have. And these slides are actually color-coded, so anything in yellow was something that came up repeatedly. So what they said, first off, is it shouldn't just be some computer scientist who has no idea about neuroscience. They need to have a neuroscience background, they need to understand methods, they need to understand experimental designs, and a lot of, sometimes people said they even should have some wet lab skills. They decided that they needed technical computing and analytic skills, and particularly coding. Uh, ideas that came up were things like translating data, revamping, stewarding, curating, and hacking, which I'm not sure has a very firm definition, but perhaps you can talk about that later. Um, they also decided library and information science was uh, skills that these kinds of people would need. So if we were to have fair data, we need to have people who can make the data so it's findable and accessible. And these are the kind of skills that would come in from library and information science. And of course, they would need to have quantitative skills for data analysis, building machine learning, my favorite, probability and statistics, uh, signal processing, and modeling. 
And one thing that kind of surprised me, and I wasn't very interested in it initially, but now I think we should be more interested, is what we would call soft skills. So management skills and team building uh, and teamwork and also ethics came up. And I'll come back to this topic uh, when I talk a little bit about industry. Regardless, they said that the instruction should have hands-on practices and students should be using real data and try to be answering real questions in their instruction. Okay, so the curriculum. The participants decided on two levels, and I know this doesn't always match and map real well on European kinds of educational structures, uh, but they had a bachelor, so four-year and master's, two-year graduate school, or two-year master's and then a PhD. So, um, I also thought that they would say that this was going to be one kind of individual that would come out of these programs, and instead they decided they would have three kinds of individuals that would come out of these programs. And I had a, an artist draw these fantastic beasts because they are to represent that the kinds of skill sets and combinations of skill sets that will be needed are nothing like the stuff we have right now. And we're going to have to think about jobs in the future and positions in the future that maybe don't even exist yet. As, as an example, um, I do things in use analyses now that I never study. So uh, something came up like PCA analysis earlier today. Uh, when I was in grad school, they said, well, there's this thing called PCA analysis, but don't worry, you'll never have enough data to use it. So, <laughs> so that's not true. So as I said, they, they came up with three kinds of positions that they envisioned. And the first is what they called a wrangler or a plumber. Uh, this would be somebody who got the data, captured the data, and got it into the system. And the participants thought that someone who had at least two years of grad school ought to be able to do this. This one they called a curation professional practitioner or a data steward. Now, you probably would be surprised to hear that scientists could not agree on a terminology for something. Uh, but they couldn't, so we ended up with three terms. And so uh, this, they thought, would need a master's degree, possibly a PhD, and then something that would sound more familiar to us, a computational neuroscientist. Uh, they would, of course, have a PhD, but also, uh, as this winged and horned to be shows, you maybe need some more skills that aren't currently in our usual toolboxes. So, those were the recommendations, at least in broad sweeping terms, of the workshop. So let's talk about where it went and where we are now. Um, we did manage to get a white paper out. Uh, if you work for the National Science Foundation or do work for them of this kind, they love to get a white paper out. Uh, if you want to see it in all detail, uh, particularly all the details of curricula that have been laid out by this workshop. If you just Google this part right here, M-D-C-U-N-E, uh, and look for the iNeuro logo on that website, you can get everything you need. And uh, along with uh, Linda Lanyon of the INCF, uh, we got a paper out that we published in Frontiers in Neuroinformatics. In this paper, uh, we took on the question of, and at least uh, as I'll say later, there are, very, there are basically no programs in the United States that are doing neuroinformatics training. So there are, however, uh, splinters of programs that could be knit together and create one. So there are 
uh, schools that have database administration, uh, a lot of programs in bioinformatics and computational biology. Neuroscience has become almost ubiquitous, and a lot of schools have information study. It's rare that a university has all four, but a lot of universities have at least some of these. And uh, I should point out that this paper came out um, about three years ago, uh, very similar in time to when the Brexit vote uh, occurred. And I am proud to say we have made a lot more progress with this paper uh, than the Brexit. So uh, I'm actually very proud that uh, the Frontiers keeps some metrics. And this, has, this paper was read more than 63% of the other Frontiers articles. And we've had almost 3,500 views of it. So the word is getting out. Again, it's only three years old. So we haven't seen vast sweeping changes yet, especially, I don't know what it's like in Europe, but in the United States, uh, deans and programs work at kind of a glacial pace, uh, and you don't just pop in with a new program. Okay, so in getting this talk ready, I was looking for extent programs on the web. Uh, there's one at Edinburgh. Uh, there's one at Erasmus Mundus. Uh, Newcastle, University of Zurich, and no surprise, the University of Warsaw. By the way, if your program isn't up here and it exists, I do apologize, but you need a better web presence because I couldn't find you. Um, this one here uh, at the University of Warsaw has both graduate and undergraduate uh, training, and so the speaker after me will talk about it, and I am anxious to hear how they do it. My point, however, is right now, neuroinformatics training is very Eurocentric. So we're looking to you for models of how to do this. Another thing, another place where we are now is the INCF resource expansion, the training space. Uh, it's really a lot better. I want to thank Matthew, because he has done a great job with that. He put in a lot of work. It's well organized. The production quality on these videos is really slick and nice. Um, we also have INCF uh, supports the Google Summer of Code. We have Software Carpentry, Ariel I think we'll be talking about. Uh, and in-person courses, they sounded great for this workshop. I was really sad I couldn't get here in time to do them. Uh, so the INCF I think is filling in a big gap uh, that is uh, left by traditional sorts of instruction. Uh, where I think we are, though, is what I uh, call the 20,000 foot, that's uh, 6,096 meters, uh, to two foot gap. So we have a lot of stuff that talks about how great neuroinformatics is and what all the things can do, um, but for the people who are actually still on the ground, and trying to get off the ground with this, um, we, people not so different from me, need some instructions like, okay, at this point you need this line of code. And that's the kind of stuff we don't yet have. We are getting close, though, to hitting that uh, two foot, that's 0.61 meters. Uh, we have a lot of nice things that are out uh, on the INCF web website in training space. Uh, introductory kinds of things, statistics, things like that, that just some background stuff. That virtual brain stuff uh, looked great. I, I hope to get further into that. I hope I can adopt it. So we do have some things that are getting to that two-foot level where people are trying to get off the ground on this stuff. Okay, so that's where we are now. Where should we go? Um, I think we still need to fill that gap between the 20,000 foot level and the two foot level. And that's, uh, I think, going to be, I hope, one of the focuses of the training space and the training education committee. Um, one of the problems that I think happens in the United States is at least our undergraduates in neuroscience and biopsychology hate math. And 
So I think we need to push them and push programs to embrace computational neuroscience. They're going to be in a quantitative world, like it or not, uh, and I think that that's something that we need to do. Along those lines, the Society for Neuroscience, in this upcoming meeting on October 21st, is going to have a workshop on teaching computational neuroscience. Uh, I put it together. And we're going to have uh, Rob Cass, Adrienne Fairhall, Pascal Wallach, who I think is going for that matrix kind of look here, uh, Walt Babiak, who is a colleague of mine I have the privilege of teaching with him, uh, a favorite of many, Matt uh, Abrams is going to speak, uh, my co-organizer, Richard Olivo, and me. So this is up and coming. Uh, I think it's something that we need to get into our undergraduate curricula. Uh, the third thing I think we should do is look to partner with industry and business, and I know we'll have some speakers later. Um, business is really getting attracted to neuroscience. This is just something I found on the web. They at least believe that knowing something about neuroscience is going to make them a whole lot of money. Um, this is a course that's offered by the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and to register for it, if memory serves, it was 4,000 US dollars to be a participant in this uh, workshop. So somebody thinks that we have some very valuable knowledge, and we ought to be talking to them um, because we do have valuable knowledge, and we got to figure out how to market it. Um, I was lucky enough to go to a meeting in Toronto uh, that the INCF put on, and this was integrating neuroinformatics research with industry. And so the industry spokesman talked about the kinds of skills that they thought they would want to see in a worker. And I thought, oh, they're going to say they want this kind of computational skill or that kind of, none of that came up, not a bit of it. They said, what we really need are soft skills. We need to find people who can manage. Uh, they can manage people or projects or especially products. And they weren't finding that in their workforce. So soft skills turned out, at least at that meeting, to be very important. I'll be interested to see what the people here say. And I think that will do it. I told you the recommendations of the iNeuro workshop, told you where to go for more information. Uh, you can either go and download it, or you can get that article uh, from Frontiers in Neuroinformatics, where we are now, and at least in my opinion, where we should go.